Recently, you mentioned Punchline earlier. We're seeing Batman's got a huge, re huge resurgence. I mean, it's probably one of the most popular titles right now. Love James Tenian's run, but that's not why it's hot. It's because of that Punchline character. We're starting to see or hear from people on New Comic Book Day, on release day. They're going to get their Batman issue and they get to the comic book store and they've escalated or elevated the price up to almost the secondary market or whatever it's selling for or going for on eBay. This is going to be... <laughs> I'm, I'm interested to hear I your know response, everyone's but looking at me. <laughs> how do you feel about this? Is it right? Is it wrong? Is it, hey, it's, it's capitalism at its best. You, you know, vote with your dollar, but either way, let's hear everyone's opinions. We're going to start with you, of course, Ben. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll be not as a cop out, the fortunate one or unfortunate, depending on how you want to look at it, that I didn't just order 600 copies of Batman 89. Boy, don't I always seem to miss on these ones. <laughs> I never seem to know what's going to be hot. So for me in my shop, we only ordered a small handful. We always do maybe basically just a couple covers over whatever our pull list is. Um, we've cut back dramatically on our uh, how much we're ordering. So back in the day when I first opened up, I had probably 10, 15 plus over whatever our pulls are. I had a nice full stock, and I just don't do that anymore because the back bins tend to fill up pretty quick when you do that. Um, so, you know, I wasn't one of those stores that was – you know, taking my 20 copies and putting them up. Uh, I have a, a tried and true uh, policy of if it's in your pull box, you get it at not only cover price, but typically whatever your discount is. And I absolutely honored that on 89 and Hellerism 3. Uh, that being said, <laughs> if I have an idea that a book uh, might and just pure speculation not any inside sources but i think oh i know this is a new series written by a good person i'm going to order 10 extra of those uh, above and beyond what i normally would would i turn around and put them online for more um sometimes yeah i will um as a store and the reality is man we got to pay bills so do i i take both sides not not to be that guy but I mean, it is what it is. You know, it's hard enough to sell some of these things, even at cover price. Uh, you know, you take a beating week in and week out, you know, just trying to get rid of the stock that you're essentially forced to buy, not only by Diamond, but by the consumers demanding that you have every title. To then expect a retailer to not take their one opportunity to try to get a little money recuperated, I think is a little, you know, unfair. Um, and also, I think most of the people that are most vocal about it are the ones who are wanting to turn around and flip it. Because I don't hear very many people who are just reading this book going, oh man, I couldn't pick up my one copy. No, those aren't the people that are complaining. The people that are complaining are the ones that went to some shop they've never been to in their life and couldn't and were mad at the shopkeeper wouldn't give them 50 copies at cover price. <laughs> the profit margin taken out from underneath them. Yeah, exactly. Um, so you know, my shop policy is, and I hope every other shop policy is, you know, being loyal to your regulars. Uh, even if it's someone who didn't typically pull it, it's, I know they're a Batman fan and it's a, a good title. I absolutely will give it to them on cover, if not cheaper. Uh, I do that with any title. Any hot, I don't really get into that as much as I used to. I used to be one of the people who would follow these sites real quickly and see what I could maximize on. But honestly, your best, you know, bottom line thing is taking care of your customers and yeah you're not making your extra ten dollars on your book that day but i've earned way more customers and way more loyalty and way more dollars in the long run doing it the way i've always done it and that's just being good to my customers and we will always do that and continue to do that so at the same time i understand why other stores do it i'm just not in a position to ever capitalize because i don't have enough copies to do that one, so <laughs> nico what do you think um, I don't know. You pick up on the merry-go-round, what you lose on the swing. Uh, and a, a lot of comic book collectors are fucking crybabies. Uh, I order, let's, okay, let's, here's my story with, uh, Batman 89 and Hell Arisen 3. Um, I told everybody on the Comic Book Wars Facebook group, uh, maybe before Final Order cut off, but I ordered 10 copies of each book before Final Order cut off, but I told everybody they should buy it. And, uh, there was this huge outcry that I was a moron. And then the books took off, and uh, I got no copies. 
<laughs> and then when they were selling for like $40, $50 a piece, I uh, wrote on the weekend update, don't pay $40 or $50 for this comic. There's all these other great Batman books to invest in. And um, I don't begrudge, uh, you know, the, I didn't prepay for them. Um, you know, I sometimes give tips to people with diamond accounts, sell them order books and order me this, order me that. And, uh, you know, I, I pay for what I order. And um, if they needed the money, they needed the money. I, again, I, having a, a local shop is hard business. I don't know how anyone does it. And I try to support any local comic book shop that I can. Uh, I think smart business is um, rewarding valued customers but that's a case-by-case -case circumstantial decision similarly if you know a retailer orders books and they want to do whatever they want with them it's their right um they don't have like an obligation to you know do the uh, hard work of pre-ordering extra copies of hot books so that some idiot can run out and grab five off the shelf and make an extra $50 on eBay that week. I mean, it's silly to, to begrudge uh, somebody for doing that hard work. Um, you know, so I, I don't have a local comic book shop. Uh, if I did, that would, uh, yeah, go get them. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I would have a, uh, I think I'm like, uh, a lot of people have uh, real strong opinions about things that they have no experience with. I try not to be one of those guys. Um, you know, I, I can kind of uh, speculate about what I may do. But again, I, I think that's very circumstantial. Um, one thing I do know from the con scene is that I reward loyal customers and, and they reward me. Sometimes they buy things that I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe anybody paid for that. Fantastic. And you pick up on the merry ground, which you'll lose on the swing. Uh, other times I'm like, man, I just let them rob me. Uh, but I try to keep it even. Uh, I don't know if that's karma or goodwill, but um, the one thing that I try to talk about uh, every chance I get is our uh, failed uh, concerted effort to do good for the comic community, like to take care of the community, to treat other members of the community as our brothers, sisters, whatever, to engage in um, apprenticeships, to mentor younger collectors, to find mentors, uh, you know, to really just support independent authors, independent artists, as well as uh, people who are, you know, doing this professionally. Um, I think if we love the hobby, uh, then we've got to love the people in the hobby. Um, and that means other collectors and, and the people, uh, you know, who are doing the hard work behind the scenes. So uh, if we keep that, I think, in the forefront, then all the other stuff sort of falls in place. So, Brian, you know where I'm going to go with this. Obviously, I have a bit of a counterpoint from uh, both these guys, and I get where they're coming from. Um, I've made my point a few times on the channel. I don't want to take that for granted, though, because I know that, um, you know, Thankfully, we, we really appreciate it. Our first podcast, we were really blessed with uh, the results of. Um, and I know there's a lot of you listening out there in audio. So for anybody who hasn't heard, I am staunchly against any retail shop marking a um, regular release book. Variant covers are different, but a regular release book above cover price on release day. And furthermore, really release week. But my hard argument is for release day. Um, and I understand immediately the backlash that I'm going to get from this. Um, I understand what like Nico is saying about like the speculator running in there to get five copies. Yes. No, a retail shop doesn't owe that customer the ability to do that. That's where one per customer limits are absolutely essential. Um, secondly, um, the thing that I, I'm going to hear about is pull lists. Yeah. Pull lists are great, but you have to ask yourself as a retailer. If it's all about the pull list, if your only customers were those who you have pulls with, could you keep the doors open? Would you, can you make a living for yourself just off of your pull list customers and pull list customers alone? With what and how many pull list customers don't come in and pick up their pull list books? That's, well, that, was my ne that was my next point is, then anytime a retailer wants to talk about retailers going out of business, they immediately point back at those same pull list customers <laughs> and say that the non-picking up of the pull lists is the reason why 
they were going out of business, which I, which I can understand. I actually think pulleys are an antiquated, terrible system that doesn't benefit the retail shop at all. They get nothing in advance. They have to put out all of the risk and all of the money. Um, but I know that retailers have expressed to me when I've brought that opinion up that when they've tried to buck that system, they end up losing out. Um, my background is in retail. I went to college for retail. Um, I've been a retailer for almost 20 years. I've managed small retail shops to large chains. I've done multi-location. I've broken a new brand in, a, in an area it never was. And I, my specialty has been sneakers for the last 15 years, which went through a renaissance kind of period of flippability. And I always kind of compare it to that. When we were the, one of the uh, few places you could get Yeezys when they were first the hottest thing out. Um, yes, you could have bought them for, from us for $175 and immediately put them on eBay and sold them for $800. But if we would have marked them up to $800, which us being a mom and pop owned shop, we could have done. But if we would have um, done that, we would immediately have separated ourselves from every other retail shop like Foot Locker and Finish Line that didn't do that, that didn't take part in that practice, who thought bigger and more long term. And we would have ha have not been able to penetrate the market the way we did over the first five years of our brand entering the southeastern United States. And it was because people started to know that they could come to our shop on release date of a hot product, we'd have it, and we wouldn't mess with them on the price. And I implore stores to understand that the acquisition of a new customer is one of the most exp biggest expenses that your store is going to take part in. And it's not a fixed cost you're going to see every day. It's not the way you see your light bill or the way you see your diamond bill. Um, and those pull list customers that you have that you love, and I absolutely stay loyal to those who are loyal to you. If you do not grow them, you're not going to be able to stay in business. And the way you are going to grow them is by consistently being able to provide that that service to your customer in a hot book. I don't sit here and say this to you at, to say it as in like you you know you're cheating anybody or anything like that. I'm actually employing retailers to try something different, a different strategy instead of looking at it and saying, "Well, I can make because I've often said like how much are we talking about? Even if you have 20 copies of Punchline, for you to make an extra $400 how many customers like could you acquire? How many new pull boxes could you set up if you sold one per customer and you talked to every customer that bought that? I don't have a problem with stores who take a hot book and attach uh, other requirements. Like you want Batman 89, you got to spend $20 in the store. Or you want Batman, there was a store that got publicity because if they sold Hell Arisen 3, you had to buy Hell Arisen 1 and 2. I don't have a problem with that. Um, these, those are creative solutions to this problem, but the worst, I, and I don't even, I understand Ben taking a book and putting it online. That's even a little different. The worst thing you can do, I feel like to a customer is have a customer walk in and you've got that book up on the shelf for $25 in their face that day when they're expecting to pay for it. And the other thing that I think we're doing too much as a hobby is assuming because we're becoming jaded that every person that walks into our store that isn't a pull list customer is suddenly out to flip a book and make a buck because sometimes they're just new to your area. Sometimes they're just, you know, checking out a different shop because they just had a bad experience at their shop. They, we have new people coming into our hobby every day. And that's, that's really the problem is I don't see a lot of them able to come in and what is going to bring them in a hot book talked about all over media batman 89 is an opportunity for you to get new customers and if you don't get hype about that if as a retailer that doesn't charge you up and go man yeah i can i hope three or four new people are going to start ordering from me so that the next time you know a big book comes out they're going to pre-order it you know, then I feel like we're missing the boat because I, you're never going to be able to stay in business long term with an extra 60, 80, 100, 200 dollars. That's mm -hmm. just not, these books don't happen often enough for you to be able to stay in business just because of that. So the argument when I get, is it a free country? Yes. Is it, you know, um, you know, you, you have the freedom to sell whatever you want for whatever you want. That's, that's your choice as a business. I get that. The free enterprise, I get that. I'm just imploring you to think about it differently because I want to see retail shops be successful and I don't want to see them continuing to repeat these mistakes and then have to do things that cannibalize themselves 
in the name of survival and business. If we if we're just doing what we're supposed to do, then these these shops should be able to thrive in what is really a boom market in the comic book kind of market right now. It's a boom time period. Well, that was a lot. <laughs> <to try yet. laughs> and uh, I think pretty much we're all on the same page here. So uh, I have never put a book uh, up on my shelf for more than cover. That would be really asking for it. Um, I My store is up in Maine. Uh, so one thing that is a benefit to me is that we don't get um, the type of traffic that say a shop in New York would. So pretty much if you're coming into my shop, I know who you are basically kind of deal. Um, I do get new customers all the time. And I think that's why uh, my shop in particular in my whole state is growing the way that we are is because we truly do treat everyone who comes in, whether it's for that hot book or not, because more often than not, like you said, is not the case. Uh, like they're, they're someone that's valued. In fact, one of the biggest collections I just took in recently was from an older woman. It was an unfortunate situation where she was trying to help out a family member who, uh, you know, had passed and they were uh, raising as much money as they possibly could. Um, I won't get into the details, but um, we were able to acquire after a lot of back and forth and uh, guiding her on how to maximize her profit without even any interest in, in purchasing it from her. Uh, was able to turn her into a customer and, and be able to acquire the books at a fair price and get her a fair price. And, um, yeah, you know, that's really our motto. And our motto, even beyond just the, the hot book thing, is just customer service, which honestly I think is something that maybe some of the more high-end stores are starting to figure out and operate like. There's a lot of these comic shops that are just dirty and, you know, dark and and they've got that click mentality still that they had back in the 70s and 80s where it was if you weren't part of the club you weren't welcome there uh and for us we're all inclusive i don't care who you are you know if you come in i'm going to treat you just like you know my biggest customer in the store uh we truly live that way and uh i think that's one reason we've grown so fast uh we've actually been trying to do that as much as we possibly can online and we've run into where we grew so fast. It's been hard to keep up with online uh, email, especially I handwrite all my emails. You email me. I'll probably email a few the same day, you know, with a paragraph or two. I do that by myself. I work 24-7, uh, and I truly try to give everyone that experience. So, you know, thankfully at our store, we do live that type of mentality. Um, so I'm not even really concerned about the hot books. Um, like I said, I wish I ordered a million of them and they were able to capitalize, but that's not really how we do business. Uh, and we certainly wouldn't ever put that up on the shelf. Uh, I, I think in our area, we're so small that if I did that, I'd be closed down pretty darn quick. Cause yeah, I can imagine how that must feel as a consumer seeing that book that, you know, you should be able to get at three ninety nine, dollars at 25, 30, $50. Like what, you know what they're doing. You're just saying I'm sleazy when you do that. <laughs> Uh, at the same time, you know, in our back bins, if we've got a book that's getting hot, you know, at what point do you do the cutoff? Uh, you could say like the first week, um, which is totally reasonable. It's a new release, right? Like the market hasn't really truly decided what its value is yet. Um, if it's been six months, you know, at that point, if something starts getting valuable, is that now the value? You know what I'm saying? So like at what time? Stand- I, I, my feeling is after a week, it's a back issue. After a week, it's not the new release. You you should be free to do what you want um, right. with, with the book and price it how you want. But that's really my argument is that new release books are supposed to be the first market. You're the first one. You're the direct market. So you're the direct way that consumers have to go about getting these comic books. Um, and if you're selling it at the secondary market price, you're skipping the first market all together which in which in turn circumvents actually what your role in the hobby is which you really don't want to do long term because you want people to be accustomed to coming to you and you being that first market because if they're going to get it from you at ebay price they can get it on ebay at ebay price and then that's the death knell of stores ultimately i got calls all across the country by the way for that guy calling me from Kentucky I've never heard from in my life hey yeah uh, and they always play it so casual too which is always hilarious because you can yeah. tell instantly what they're calling for you happen to have a oh what was it um Batman 89 yeah that's it you happen to have a few copies can I get 10 
Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll mail you the drugs right out. <laughs> That, so, and I love seeing the social media posts of shops putting up the we don't have Batman 89 uh, signs in the window. I see that in the sneaker business because we sell out by 8 a.m. of a popular sneaker first thing in the morning. And then you get calls all afternoon for do you have, do you have, do you have. So No, but do you want me to set you up a, a click? <laughs> yeah. <right>. Okay. <laughs> So me, as a buyer, if I'm going into the comic book store and a new release has jacked up the price, if I don't want to buy it, I'm not going to buy it. I'm going to say one thing to go across all of it because own your results. That's what I'm going to say is I don't have a problem if you're the comic book store and you want to, hey, there's a hot book. I'm going to sell it for however many. That's fine. Own your results. If you lose your customer base, that's what market capital, free market capitalism is. If you're the buyer, if you want to pay that much for it, by all means, pay for it. Own your results. Don't cry afterwards that, hey, this, bo this book dropped in value. Or don't cry, hey, you know, sorry, we're going to have to close our doors. We don't have any comic book customers. Do what you want to do. That's what market capitalism is. Just own your results. Me personally, if I go in, I'm not going to buy it for that much unless... I absolutely really, really want that book. If the risk is worth it for me or I don't care how much it costs, I want it in my collection, I'll spend that much. I personally will not pay that much for a book, especially a Batman cover A, 89. I will never pay that much. But <laughs> do what you want to do. It's a free, you know, that's what, that's what makes the country great. That's what makes the, everything great. But I agree with everyone's point of view at the end of the day, just own your results and then move on. Because we hear both of it. Everyone wants to speak on other one's opinions or everyone wants to speak on, oh, you're just saying that because you don't have a pool list or you don't run a comic book store. Or you're just saying that because I don't do what you want to do. Just own the results of it. 